But I spent all my summers up here um, with my relatives, uh, almost all of whom were vets, uh, working class, lower working class. My grandfather spent the last 20 years of his life working in the post office in Mechanic Falls. Um, and at the age of 10, I won a scholarship to a very elite boarding school. Um, and so I had this bifurcated existence where I was going with the sons of the ultra-rich and then coming back to places like Mechanic Falls. And um, my, my hatred for the rich and authority comes out of that experience. <laughs> Um, because I understood, I mean, I went to school with, you know, the George Bushes, um, you know, these people who ha were given everything, and no matter how often they failed, there was always someone to pick them up. And I was very cognizant of the native intelligence of my own family who were never given any chances at all. Um, and I knew where my loyalty lay. Um, we used to have a, they were eccentrics without question, um, we used to have a wood lot up there, and uh, there was a lumber mill. I don't know if it's still there. One of my uncles, he was actually my mother's cousin, but was my, we call him uncle, ran. And um, he'd been a Marine in World War II. And one day he was driving with two of his workers in his truck with, of course, the gun rack in the back. He drives past the wood lot, and there's two guys from Massachusetts with chainsaws cutting down all our wood. And uh, he takes his shotgun, <laughs> out of the, off the gun rack with his two workers and he walks out in the wood lot and he clanks it up and loads it, flicks off the safety and goes, you guys have 10 to get out of here. One, two, three, and they, these Massachusetts guys dropped their chainsaws and ran. Well, the funny part is that they decided to take my uncle to court thinking they were gonna get justice in Mechanic Falls, Maine. And they went to court and of course they called up the two workers who had witnessed the event who were in my uncle's truck and they go, nope, we didn't see nothing. <laughs> so you may have seen the hit piece I, that was in the New Republic, and you can get from Stan my response, which was sent out today. But as soon as I read it, I said, man, I wish I had my uncles. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote a book, and if anybody wants to know about it, we'll talk about it afterwards. I don't want to fill up the talk with it, but I'm happy to talk about it. it was, I, I spent many years covering the Middle East. I'm kind of numb to it after years of being attacked by AIPAC. Um, I wrote a book a couple years ago called Death of the Liberal Class. It started out as a book on the press. And uh, it's kind of a funny story. It, it was a good lesson for me as a writer. Um, never write a book that's somebody else's idea. Um, so, Knopf, which is a huge publishing house, went to uh, the former editor of the Washington Post, Len Downey, and said, well, will you write a book about the He said, no, I don't want it. So then they went to the former editor of the New York Times, Joel Elliveld, and said, do you want it? He said, no, I don't want it. And then, then they came to me, um, and how they thought they would get a book on the press that looked anything like the book that they would get from the former editors of the New York Times, the Post, I don't know. And I turned in my manuscript, and uh, the editors read it, and they were appalled. Um, they uh, called up my agent and said, okay, well, we're going to publish it, but we're going to give it to an editor to take out all the negativity. <laughs> so you can imagine how that went down. Um, and I frantically searched around for another publisher. You get, you get half of your advance up front. And I frantically searched around for a publisher who would take the book. I, I got Nation Books to take it on the condition that they paid that half. They could have the whole book. Um, but in that transition, I began to think that it wasn't just the press as a liberal institution that had collapsed, but all of the pillars of the liberal establishment had collapsed. The Democratic Party, uh, education, and I suspect here at the University of Maine, like any state university, you are under assault from these forces. Um, culture becoming completely commercialized. Um, and so I, the book transformed into a better book, uh, which asked that question, why? What happened? How did we get here? And it took me back to World War I. Because on the eve of World War I, 
we had powerful, radical, and populist movements that had attained that power through the blood of the American working class. The labor wars in the United States were the bloodiest in any industrialized country. Hundreds of workers in this country died for the 40-hour work week, for safe work conditions, for an end to child labor, for unions. Thousands were wounded. And my grandfather was in the main National Guard in the 30s. And uh, he would tell me that the Guard was called out to beat up strikers. And he had his old truncheon in the barn. And he had 23 nicks in it with his pen knife, each nick for a communist that he'd hit. And that struggle, which Howard Zinn chronicles so movingly in the people's history of the United States, as you heard, I teach in a prison. And um, when you teach in a prison, it's the exact opposite of teaching in a university because in the, in the university setting, you're supposed to write in the course catalog something very sexy to entice the undergraduates, promise to show them a lot of movies and things like that. <laughs> when you're in a prison, it's, you've got to get it through the prison authority, so you've got to write something completely innocuous and boring. So the class before this one, I submitted a proposal to teach American history, the Constitution, our founding fathers, the system of government, which flew through, and then I bought uh, every prisoner a copy of Howard Zinn's The People's History of the United States. <laughs> now, I never met Zinn, unfortunately. I've always admired him. I mean, his book, Politics and History, is brilliant. And um, when I would, uh, so it's African-American, poor African-American men who've never been taught their own history. And Zinn is very cognizant throughout that book of the African-American experience and the African-American struggle. And um, what was moving was to watch how the sto their own story, the story of Frederick Douglass, the story of Sojourner Truth, the story of John Brown, um, that ignited a passion within them. And I would be giving a talk, I would give 90-minute talks on each section of the book each week, and, and I would hear from the classroom, damn, damn, we've been lied to. And Zinn captured in that book something absolutely vital about us. And that is that this system was constructed in such a way as to disenfranchise all but the moneyed, propertyed, and mostly slaveholding elite. And I just did a talk in New York with Rick Wolf and Cornell West on Thomas Paine. We're doing, we, one of the things that all of us found among the Occupy movement is that there wasn't a kind of literacy among a lot of the kids in the movement about the radicals of the past. So we started with Thomas Paine, who's a kind of perfect example. Uh, and the only reason that the, uh, the Whigs made an alliance with Paine is because in Pennsylvania, uh, that old, none of that pre-war elite defected to American independence. It was the only state where the post-war elite was completely new. And it was a very uncomfortable alliance with Paine because Paine was an abolitionist and quite presciently said that um, Americans could not call for liberty until they call for liberty for African Americans and that it was a kind of poison within the body politic, which of course we paid for with 600,000 lives um, in the Civil War. Uh, and so as soon as the revolution was over, Paine was publicly vilified, driven out, um, I mean, just an amazing life, ends up in France, denounces the French terror, ends up in prison, they want to execute him. There's a scene where they bring Danton into the Luxembourg prison, and they embrace right before Danton is guillotined, and dies in utter obscurity, forgotten, and uh, poverty in New York City, and six people come to his funeral, and two of them are black. Um, and he's the most important, maybe the only American revolutionist. Um, I mean, common sense, uh, Age of Reason writes a man, these were, these sold hundreds of thousands of copies, which he never took money for because he wanted people to read them. Uh, all, that whole system was designed in such a way uh, through the Senate, senators were appointed, through the disenfranchising of women, uh, of course Native Americans, African Americans, people without property, 
And everything that we got, we fought for and paid for with tremendous suffering and sacrifice. So all of these movements, which never achieved power, as Zinn points out, whether it was the Liberty Party that fought slavery, the suffragists who fought for women's rights, um, the labor movement, the old wobblies, the Communist Party, who we utterly erased from history. If you were an African American in the 1920s, like Paul Robeson, the only place where you were accepted as an equal was in the Communist Party. Uh, even Debs, the reason the Pullman strike fails is because uh, in the end, the white railroad workers would not unite with the black railroad workers. Uh, and all of these movements opened up the space. On the eve of World War I, anarchists, uh, we had hundreds of anarchist journals in a variety of languages, Yiddish, German, Lithuanian, uh, Emma Goldman, Berkman, of course the Haymarket martyrs, um, and, and what happened was the war. Wilson, who had run for re-election in 1916 on the, on the slogan, he kept us out of the war, begins to feel tremendous pressure from Wall Street because with the collapse of the Tsarist front, of, the, of uh, the Eastern Front, the Kaiser had the capacity to move 51 divisions back to the Western Front. And if you remember that last summer, there was a huge push where they broke through the lines. And the bankers who had lent tremendous sums to the British and the French knew that if they lost the war, they'd never be repaid. Now, this country had a strong tradition of isolationism, but that's really a misnomer. It, it was a strong tradition of pacifism. And Wilson, after 30 days, had to call up conscription because nobody would volunteer to serve. Um, there's a great line from Thoreau, you probably know it, you know, how about how soldiers are not educated because if they really were educated, they'd all desert. So when Wilson goes to make the announcement from the White House to the Congress, he has to be protected by an entire troop of cavalry because of fear of anarchist bombs. And there's a fascinating debate. I went into the Princeton archives and read the papers of Lippmann and Ballard and others who were. There was a debate between Wilson and the, the kind of intellectual elite and Lippmann embodying it in his book, Public Opinion, which is a kind of blueprint for control. That's where the term manufacturing consent comes out of public opinion, which Chomsky, who I just saw last Thursday at MIT, and Herman write his great book on the press, Manufacturing Consent. And Lippmann says to Wilson, Wilson wants to immediately pass the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act and shut everything down through force. And Lippmann said, no, we can create a system of mass propaganda that effectively pulls everyone into the war effort. And that's how you get the Committee for Public Information, the first system of modern mass propaganda in human history because it employed the understanding of crowd psychology pioneered by figures like Le Bon, Trotter, and Sigmund Freud. That people are not moved by fact or reason. They're moved by the skillful manipulation of emotion. And Hollywood starts churning out these movies like The Kaiser, The Butcher of Berlin, 45,000, they call them Three Minute Men, fanning out graphics artists, and then they create their own news division. Every publication had to be pro-war in its stance, which the masses wouldn't accept and shut down for the war. Appeal to Reason, a socialist journal, had the fourth highest circulation in the country, does accept and prints pro-war editorials. And then you have that recalcitrant minority, uh, Jane Addams, Randolph Bourne, and the great Eugene V. Debs, who Wilson detested, which is why uh, when Wilson uh, wouldn't even give him amnesty after he put him in prison for opposing the draft, and it was Harding who finally let him out. Um, and it's fascinating to read people like Adams and Bourne at that moment because they despair not only of the populace which has been seduced into the war effort, but of the intellectual class that has been seduced as well. That liberal elite who went from, uh, you know, the, the community houses that have been created on the Lower East Side, the settlement houses, uh, turning that kind of grounded idealism into this abstract idealism of supporting the war that would end all war. 
And what happened after the war, and Dwight McDonald, who's a writer that is not read at much but should be, brilliant writer, and if you know anything about Chomsky, McDonald, um, uh, I think he married into some money, and so for five years he printed this journal called Politics, right a after World War II, um, until he went broke. And he was publishing Betelheim and Hannah Aaron and George Orwell and I mean, all sorts of great stuff. And Chomsky, credit, he never had a circulation above 5,000. Chomsky credits that journal with his political awakening, um, which is always the importance of serious ideas. Of, of, and he writes, McDonald writes this great essay called Mass Cult, Mid Cult. And he said, the problem with the intellectual class is that it seeks a popular audience and dilutes its intellectual message thinking that the importance is numbers. It's never numbers. The fact is that that journal, because of its sophistication and depth, was training, without question, the most important intellectual in the United States, which is Chomsky. Um, so McDonald says, what happened at the end of the war was seismic, because two things went on. First, the Committee for Public Information which produced Edward Bernays, the father of modern public relations, Laswell, and others. When the war is over, it goes straight to Madison Avenue and starts working on behalf of corporations as well as the government. When the 1954 coup, they hire Bernays' PR firm. But the other thing that happened, which McDonald wrote about, was that we immediately entered the, what he calls the psychosis of permanent war. And he says none of the political theorists of the 19th century, including Karl Marx, grasped this phenomenon, the psychosis of permanent war. The only time Marx, I think, writes about war is in the Franco-Prussian War, and he hopes the Germans will win because then the workers' re rebellion or you know, state will happen more quickly. Um, and that, uh, that psychosis of permanent war, where instantly the dreaded Hun becomes the dreaded Red, was used to break the movements that had before, right on the eve of the war, pushed the business class and the oligarchs and the elites up against the wall. So after the war, you see the heavy use of the sedition in the Espionage Act. You see the Berkman and Goldman are deported. The masses are shut down. Appeal to reason, even though they played the game, are shut down. The wobblies are broken. Um, so that by the 1920s, the labor movement is obliterated. And it resurrects itself in the 30s with the breakdown of capitalism. And, and that is an important moment in, hum, in, in American history because it shows, and this is something Chomsky has pointed out, how a functioning liberal class is supposed to behave. A functioning liberal class, it, the liberal class was never designed to be the left. The liberal class was designed as the safety valve so that when capitalism breaks down, you can ameliorate the capitalist system to keep it afloat. And Roosevelt said, my greatest achievement was that I saved capitalism. And the only reason a liberal class will function is because it has pressure from the populist and radical movements that remain fast to a moral imperative, but that never achieve power. Um, so much of the New Deal came out of the populist party, came out of those radical movements. And what happens after World War II is that those radical movements are finally destroyed. And I don't know if you know this, Stan bought my house in Norway, but um, the, I believe the only meeting of the Communist Party in uh, Norway, Maine, took place on my former front yard. <laughs> By, f uh, it was hell, it was, he, they were invited into Norway by Freeland Howe, who was the brother of the guy who owned the house, um, who was, ran a music shop in Norway and was a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. And the famous story is George Howe, his eccentric brother who owned the house and called it Summit Study and stood up there and like fed birds and he was a naturalist and he used to take kids out on uh, overnight trips and he, he, he was an amazing geologist. And, but uh, I was looking at the journals and the historical society, and they're all around the campfire eating mushrooms. <laughs> so, um, and Howe walked down into the field and uh, came back and reportedly said, there's nobody down there I'd trust the government with. <laughs>
um, after the 50s, we saw with McCarthy the destruction, the final destruction. And Ellen Schrecker, the really great historian, has written two very good books on this. One is called No Ivory Tower, which is how academia was purged. And the other, I think it's called Such Were the Crimes. Um, but it was an eye-opening book for me because when we know about those figures like Charlie Chaplin or Pete Seeger, but we know about the, you know, the, the, uh, the elites, the writers who were blacklisted. But in fact, the, the really pernicious damage of, of the Red Scare in the 50s was that the FBI, and let's not forget why the FBI was formed in 1908. Um, the FBI was basically a goon squad uh, that was sent in to break radical movements, to spy on them, uh, to blackmail them, um, and that's, of course, all J. Edgar Hoover did, all the way up to Martin Luther King calling him in his hotel room before the Nobel Prize trying to get him uh, to commit suicide. But the FBI would go into, like, public high schools and give them a list of six or seven teachers who were deemed to be sympathetic or red, and they would be instantly dismissed. There was never any evidence and they would be blacklisted. They could never teach again. And they destroyed all sorts of organizations, including the Union for Social Workers, which used to be a very radical union in this country, and which not only uh, fought for the working conditions of social workers, but actually uh, organized on behalf of their clients. All of this was destroyed. Our, our, one of our greatest journalists, I.F. Stone, uh, becomes a pariah. And can't even get a job at the nation and ends up uh, running I.F. Stone's Weekly uh, out of his basement. And at that point, we essentially were disarmed. And uh, all, that's how we have seen all of, starting 1948 with the uh, Taft-Hartley Act, which until NAFTA was the worst piece of legislation for American workers, making it very difficult to organize. Um, we saw step by step the New Deal, all of the advances of the New Deal destroyed, unions broken. We now, less than 12% of American workers are unionized. Most of them are public service employees who can't, don't even have the right to strike. Um, uh, and we began to shift from what the Harvard historian Charles Mayer calls an empire of production, where we actually produce things, to an empire of consumption where both the empire and the individuals within it were borrowing frantically to maintain a lifestyle and an empire they could no longer afford. And with a rise in that shift, we give birth to the monstrosities of the faux liberal, embodied in particular by Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Those who speak that traditional feel your pain language of liberalism and yet betray all of the core values that 